Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Same 24 Hours podcast. I am very excited about our guest today. Sherry Salata is here. Did I get it right? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Sherry. It is my Hi. big, big honor to talk to you today. So thank you for taking the time. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. So you have it's to show so everyone the puppy dog. Um, okay, let's see. That way, let's those see. who are listening go and watch Dolly. the video. Hey, Dolly. Look, oh, look. There she oh is. there she is. She likes to come to work with mama. This is <laughs> this is so crazy. Like she does she she doesn't listen in a lot of ways, but when it's time to go to work and knows it's Zoom, then she likes to sit right next to me and, and co-pilot. That's excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So I heard you, I must have been on a podcast um somewhere, and you had said I had created a dream come true career. Mm -hmm but I had not created a dream come true life. So let's kind of start there. Tell everyone, I'll record an introduction that tells everyone like the resume yeah. stuff, but tell everyone a little bit about what you mean, like where you've been, what this dream career was and, and what the shift was that had you going after a dream life. Well, well, honestly, first of all, uh, it took me a long time. It, it wasn't like I, I, I bopped out of the University of Iowa and, and stepped into my dream career. That is not what happened. In fact, it was crazy business for years and years of not really making enough money, you know, being in a, in a series of jobs that weren't the best fit. Um, toy stores, 7-Eleven, um, typing pools, you know, and the list goes on. And finally, I did get a break being hired. It was called secretary then. Um, and we were still using fax machines. So it was uh, a, as a secretary for an, um, an executive producer at an ad agency. And I knew like, I, I just kept, if I could get my foot in the right door, I'll, I'll be able to do something with it. You know, I'm getting my foot through all these other doors and, and just not feeling satisfied, not feeling like I was like in my purpose. And, but once I got into that ad agency and knew I was going to learn something creative, something that required, you know, a, a, a marketing degree, like it, it things were going to come together for me. And sure enough, uh, soon I was producing television commercials, but I still was very junior and I still wasn't making very much money. And, um, you know, I, uh, ultimately, um, through a series of miracles, synchronicities, coinky dinks, I landed in a fairly entry-level promo producer position job at the Oprah Winfrey Show. And my friend, I was not 21 or 25. I was 35. Right. The day I walked in those The doors. overnight success of 15 yeah. years of hard work, right? Exactly. Yeah. 15 years of twists and turns and wrong turns. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, you know, once I was there, uh, the, the blessing of all of that experience was I knew what, what it was like, I wasn't younger and less appreciative. I was like, so appreciative, like, you know, everything, everywhere I turned, um, uh, it, it, in whatever job I had at the show, I, I knew it was rarefied air. I knew like my mission was like, had been escalated even beyond my dreams. And I just kept my head down, did my work. And uh, next thing you know, how, how many years later was it was? Maybe 10 years later, I was the executive producer of the actual show, which how that even happened is, is super crazy. And, and, and all good things, you know, all good things. I mean, being, being paid to build a spiritual life is what I felt like was the greatest company benefit. Um, and it was, it felt so important that I gave everything, 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 everything. And um, went on to, we sunset the show, we finale the show in 2011, which I, I can scarcely believe. And then um, went out to LA with Oprah to help her uh, kind of shore up the, the network, the own network that had launched and had some struggles. So 
when I finally had a chance and, and we spent some time doing that, when I finally had a chance to take stock or do a real reckoning, I could see that, oh yes, you have indeed created a dream come true career for yourself, but life, not so much. Mm. And um, I don't mean that in terms of, I really mean it from um, an emotional, um, spiritual place. Like there was a lot of anxiety and pressure in those roles. I'm sure. And, 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 and it's like, I had to like, keep that, some of that to myself. Right. You know, because no, the staff really doesn't want to want to see you going. No, it's never going to happen. So <laughs> keep 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 some of that to yourself, so you're a little bit more calm and cool, and you know, and and not really managing it, you know, away from the office when I was away from the office. So when you know you you're, you you're the ways you like like for instance, here's a perfect example of what I mean. Smoking. I was a smoker. I was one of those typical um, executive producers outside in a down coat, 30 degrees below smoking. It is a dream career. <laughs> like, like it was my breath work. Right. You know, and, and I've talked to people since people go, yeah, that's what it is. You know, for smokers, it is like how you calm yourself, how you take a moment, how you do. And, and so now, even when I say that it feels like another life, because of course, um, smoking is terrible for you and everybody must quit immediately, um, which, which I did many years ago, but it was those kinds of things. It's like, is that, you want to be a smoker? You want to be a smoker drinking all of these vats of diet soda and, you know, trying to calm your, your inner anxiety with the big fat pizza on Friday night instead of a date with a gorgeous man. It was, it was that kind of thing that, ooh, you know, I have a great family, great friends, feel very loved, but it was like, eh, you got to shore some things up. Yeah. And you said somewhere that you were busy creating little pieces of light for your, for these audiences, but then there was <laughs> moments where, you know, you're standing and I can totally envision this standing there outside in the rain smoking. Cause I was a smoker too. I mean, same thing. Yeah. I had this vision. I would move to New York. I would have a martini in one hand and a cigarette yeah. in the other and maybe a silk yeah. robe. And now I'm five years sober. Cause same thing. It's like, I can't be, a, I can't handle drinking and I can't handle smoking, but right. there is this sense that you're creating something magical that you're creating it for other people, but there's a disconnect, right? And creating yeah. that same magic for yourself. So was there like a pivotal, pivotal moment where you thought, uh, I'm kind of failing at creating this life I love, or was it like a sadness? Like, how did it, I, I mean, I know you said it wasn't one, one thing, but it's not like really one thing. I mean, it really was, it was like all my earlier miseries, you know, where it's like, you just start sinking so slowly. You don't even realize it. You're not even, you know, you don't even sense because you, you're in a rut now, you're in a pattern, you don't even realize you're not all that happy, um, that um, you know, you're know you dulled, you're dulled in some respect. Um, you know, the idea of getting what I call your esteemable practices shored up, you know, it's like, eh, why meditate? Life is, you know, like, like you know, it, it's, it's a little like that. It's a downward spiral. You know, it's, it's, it's really that thing where you can make yourself really unhappy. And when, you know, coming out of it, I could look back and see, I had been doing that since I was a teenager, mm -hmm. which is not being willing to make changes until I was so miserable, I couldn't get out of bed. Instead of right off the bat, leaning in the direction of what feels good, leaning into happiness, Leaning into, oh, it feels good when I take care of myself. It feels good when I stay up on that. Leaning into that, leaning to that. Instead, it's let, you know, just, you know, stay put until you're so unhappy, it's hard to move. And then you have no choice. It's like change or die. Right. And, and, and the problem with that, it's effective. It's effective. <laughs> 
The problem with that is, and misery just waits for you behind every corner. Right. Because the universe is going to keep helping you find your way, but it's just going to be a miserable experience. Right. And it had until, to be like, kind of, yeah. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was well, just going to say it had to be yeah. interesting to be producing the Oprah show and having all of these, you know, spiritual things and people and Janine Roth coming on to talk about food, yeah. your relationship and, and your, I mean, was it like you were going from one show to the next and be like, yeah, yeah, that was great. I mean, did any of that at any point sink in and say, oh, I'm going to do gosh. that one day or what? Listen, who knows where I'd be with all, <laughs> without access to all of that? Who knows right. where I'd be? Oh, I, 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 I soaked it up. I, that was the, the biggest benefit of that job for me was just being paid to take that information in uh, you know I, I had notebooks filled with the wisdom of the day um but here you know and 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 I used that to say look at me I mm. had the access to everything everybody every program everything and it's still it's not an intellectual exercise. At a certain point, you have to stop the seeking and get to finding, you know? That makes my butt a, pucker a little. <laughs> at a certain yeah. point, you have to take, fire yourself from that seeking job. Because what, you know, at a certain point, seeking is really about not finding. It's like, you're never going to let anything get bone deep. You're just going to be like, yeah, but maybe this program, but maybe this expert, but maybe this thing, maybe that thing. And the truth is there are a million different languages all leading to the same place, which is you are worthy. You are loved. You are supposed to live the life of your dreams. You are love. You're, you're to give and receive love and it's supposed to be fun and joyful. So, you know, pick a flavor. Mm -hmm. That's what I say. Pick a flavor, get, get your things lined up, pick a flavor and do it because that hunting around for, you know, somebody else to say it different, that'll make you really claim it for yourself is, is a form of a kind of a invisible reverse self-sabotage. Yes. You know, it's like you get now, what are you doing with the seeking all the time? You know, there is a time for seeking. There's a time when you're younger where you've got to find your language and find your spiritual practice and see what resonates. And, and that will always be true on the transformation journey to some degree, but take yourself out of the seeking business and, and try to put yourself in the finding business and see if that makes a difference in how you approach your daily life. That you is know. so, I do know I'm a, I'm a habitual seeker. I'm in the business of finding now, it's, but it's a new thing. It's only been the last like three ish years, but it's funny. Cause I was talking to a friend right before you and she and I are twin, like twins from another, you know, mother. And we always make it about the food, you know, we'll check in every day and we're like, we did good on our food plan. We did not do good. And we were laughing about it because we you know, your day, when you're in this space of seeking, your day can be made or broken based off of total crazy things like your food plan or your exercise or, and you can yeah. just say it was a terrible day. Never mind yeah. the fact that I had a great lunch with a friend or I read a good book and I felt That's like right. you just ignore it. You can just put everything in this one basket about you ate a cookie. <laughs> and yeah. we were laughing about it because that is the business of seeking. Like you're just yeah. seeking to create sabotage. And you said that a little bit ago, and that was so powerful because it is a form of addiction because you're just totally. addicted to it. And then you can say, well, I'm no good at that either. Yeah. So I guess That's I should sure. quit. Yeah. So think about this. Do you think, and, and this, this just sparked this thought for me, because it reminds me of my college journals that I finally had to burn. They were so ridiculous. <laughs> Do you think that a food journal is more important than 
a meditation practice. Yes. You do. You do yeah. think that. Okay. No, because but I don't want to think that. But I'm being honest right. with you. Right. Yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. I, good. So that's yeah. what I'm saying. Because for a lot of years, a food journal and a bunch of other other things, those are tools to be used in service. But not, you know, like that, none of that is gonna fill up that empty space. Right. You know, when you were asking me, you know, the career and then the life, here's I had to go on a book tour to figure this out. How about this? That it was, and it hit me like a bolt of thunder. Like I, I'm trying to remember, I, I think I, I was in a bookstore doing a little thing and I went, oh my God, that one of the issues for me and for lots of um, achieving women is that very early on, we've mixed up achievement and worthiness. Mm, yes. something happened something happened like honor roll good report card lots of love 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 and shininess came to us and so next thing you know we are inadvertently launched on this path of seeking achievement to feel loved and worthy achievement loved and worthy can you imagine for somebody who has that screwed up working for oprah just saying my heart yes. is racing for you just relatives that you haven't seen in a mil I mean please even my own mother bless her heart on the other side now I mean I could see that it made a difference for her like all of a sudden I was really quite golden um and my flaws were were, were easily dismissible so yeah so you know so I get to take that to the highest level and then say oh my gosh, I was mistaken. They're, they're not intertwined. In fact, they're not even related. They're not even in the, in the same ballpark. But, but Sherry, how can that be true? <laughs> I know? know. I mean, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know, but we don't, oh, we don't really believe that. No, when, when, you, when you, yeah, listen, here, here, this is, this is the definition of, of a epiphany it plummets you in a bone deep sea of knowingness. That's what I think. Like there's lots of things I could tell you that I understood intellectually. They were probably in my notebooks, Marianne Williamson, Gary Zukov, Deepak Chopra, and any of those people. But it's when you have the epiphany where you see, oh, 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 oh. I seeded that so early. I kept reinforcing it, kept reinforcing it that is a problem. So what are you going to do now with this worthiness wound now that you're going to just remove achievement from that and you're going to recognize they're not related? Um, what, do you, what are you going to do with that? How are you going to heal that? And the only healing for that is stillness. I think. Yeah. It's connecting with the force, the power, the, that your inner being, it's, it's really plugging in to that energy. And, you know, that is, so, so that becomes the, the, that becomes the real practice, you know, like a food journal is not helpful for me. It's helpful for somebody else, but those are little practical tools. Right. Those, those can't be the driver. So that's what I, that's what I work on now, honestly. And it's in, it will always be a work in progress. It's always going to be a journey. Yeah. That's, that's part of the mistake in that way of thinking about programs and lists and things that if you just check enough boxes, it'll be over. Right. You'll be done. And you'll get to the destination, which is 150 pounds, like whatever it is. And then what? Yes, <laughs> then I'm transformed. What? I'm enlightened. I'm pure consciousness. No, it is, it is, it is going to be, it's a way, it's going to be a way of being. Now we may have said that to ourselves a million times. It's a way of life. It's a lifestyle. It's not at this. Okay. But until we really take that to heart that it isn't one and done, that every day I need to check what I'm saying to myself. Every day I need to see what's my mood. I'm, I'm the regulator of that. 
So what is my mood? And if it's not where it needs to be, what can I do to get that up? Because mm. when I'm in a high vibration state, my whole life is transformed. My life experience is different. And anybody who comes in contact with me has a different life experience. <laughs> That's it's a very like important point. <laughs> your gift. It becomes your gift. You know, it's really not just about you. And when you said that, I had a, a, a realization from a couple of nights ago, I was getting dinner ready and we had, we have, I mean, let me say that. I had dinner delivered. I was heating it up <laughs> and there was like some focaccia bread with some truffle honey. Okay. And the truffle honey was supposed to go on something else, but I was like, this seems like a good dip for the bread. Right. And so here comes my 13 year old son and he usually walks in and he's like, what's for dinner? I tell him. And he's like, Oh, you know, cause all he wants to eat is hot dogs and pizza. And so I had this moment where I heard him come in and I was like, oh, great. Here we go again. He's going to complain about the dinner. And instead, I just had this moment where I said, I bet if I dip this bread in this honey and put this in this boy's mouth, he's going to just love it. But it, it took me this like heart moment where I had to like get out of my head and get out of like everything to say, hey, come here. I got something for you and dip it and give him the bread and watch him just experience this moment. And that doesn't sound like a big deal, but coming from someone who's like very goal oriented and we're going to cook the dinner and we're going to, it yeah. was crazy to me that I had to, and it, it was a moment of stillness in a way because yeah. I kind of stopped time and I was like, it was a moment make, of presence, presence. Yes. 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 I would, what would make this little boy's afternoon bread and honey, you know, presence. and it also was me getting off the food thing, you know, it's like, enjoy this amazing homemade focaccia bread with this amazing local honey. Right. Yeah. And that is presence and that, yeah, that is that's presence. big for me. <laughs> well, listen, I mean, that's the other thing about achievement and, and the, the doing, the doing treadmill is that how much of your life you miss. It's supposed to be about the bread and honey moment, yeah. not about the checking the box moment. And I don't know, maybe at, at a certain point, we just decided that those kind of moments were, weren't as valuable as the accomplishing, accomplishing moments. But um, I can totally see, especially after 2020, how wrong I was about that, like, I mean, yay, I get a second chance to revisit how I produce and craft those moments in my life and knowing that it's the, the nothing moments that are the best. But honestly, the whole damn world had to shut down before I could really see that. True, true, same here. I mean, really, like, I, I, I you know, I, I even think about I think in some ways, like, wow, you were still fooling yourself. You were still like showing up for work at your kitchen table with your laptop from nine to six. And you were still doing all that, you know? And now, you know, and, and how about this thing? And the noticing about myself that I can't go walk out in the garden at 1030 because those are work hours. Like, I'm an entrepreneur. I could do what I want, whenever I want. I could do nothing today if I want. You know, it's, it's like e even when I've completely freed myself of any kind of obligations or expectations to anyone, I still, I still come back to chaining myself up. So it's, it's definitely a practice. It's like, it's like I make myself go for a walk at like 1120, you know? Right. And I, I make myself do something out of the ordinary, you know, uh, watch a movie at noon, you know, and then maybe catch up on some writing at seven, like just mix it up, like get out of the habit of putting an old, I use this word with a bit of love, but because it grew our world, but this patriarchal system of how to live your life. It's like, I'm, 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 I still work to free myself of that. And I understand that totally because I was a attorney for 
13 years and got out of it for the reason that I wanted to write and I wanted to coach and podcast, you know, at two 30 yeah. on a Friday. Um, yeah. but I will do the same thing. I'll get up at seven and think I really should go ahead and get online and do this, this, and this, but I really want to read a book. And I have this guilt because I watch my husband buzz around because he's got this very yeah. important job. And I'm like, well, he's buzzing. I should be buzzing. We should, and our kids yeah. are like, ah, these parents are crazy. You know, so yeah. recognizing I have designed this life to be able to sit down with my book and my coffee. And yeah. I, ha I have my meetings scheduled in the times I've chosen, but yet I, I try and pack it in. And so back to what you said about it being a practice, I think part of it is recognizing our current habits, right? The things, yeah. the nonsense we're kind of doing and how, did you have to kind of see what you were doing before you could start? A oh new yeah. I, I, yeah. And still, you know, yeah. and still it's like, it's like the moment I realized I was out to dinner and this is, this is pre COVID, but out to dinner with some people I really like a lot and everybody's scrolling on their phones. Look at, uh, looking at other people's lives. Like yeah. what the hell is going on and what kind of emergency are, is any one of us going to have in the next 90 minutes, you know, right. nutty, nutty. We're here together. Why are our phones on the table? You know, so I just, uh, you know, I just start to notice what pulls me away from the life I say I want to claim for myself. And if I allow myself to be pulled away, why am I doing it? What is my motivation? Am I sabotaging the life of my dreams? Or is it that I'm in a mood and I just don't feel like doing what I know will lift me up? Like, what is it? I try not to leave those things a mystery. Do you think sabotage is a form of rebellion? Do you think somewhere deep inside of us we're, we're thinking, okay, I was a good girl. Ugh, I hate that term. I was a good girl when I was achieving, when I was getting good grades, when my mm -hmm. parents were proud of me. Where does self-sabotage come into all of this? Is it a fear of success? Is it a rebellion to the achievement? Why, why do we sabotage? I mean, I think all those things are true. Mm -hmm. I think there's still a little piece of me that is just telling my mom, I'm not going to do what she says. I'm not going to do it your way. And so that, that's, the, that's the immaturity that has to be raised up and grow, grown up by our adult selves. And I also think, I never, I, I, I just really struggled to believe this was true, but I think it is, that we, we, that we have a barrier, a limit to our own happiness levels. Yes. And that crossing beyond that when we've set those levels and we've lived within those levels and that crossing beyond that's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable because it, it raises our level of anxiety that someone's gonna steal that happiness or something bad's gonna happen and then we're gonna be really unhappy. So let me just stay at this level, this manageable level of mm, things are okay. It's not that great. And, and, and then maybe I won't be shattered, you know, when I do have to um, walk through some of the human experiences that we all know are, are, are challenging. Yeah. Something, it's something in there, you know, I press myself on that. Like, you know, there's lots of different spiritual expressions for it from different teachers. How good can you stand it? You know? That is, a, that is a quantum philosophical question we should all be asking ourselves because as happy as you allow yourself to be is about how good you can stand it. And if you want that better life, you've got you've to flex your muscles enough to allow that level to rise and get co cozy in it. Right. No, that's such a good point. I mean, I was talking to someone recently and I said, you know, I think I just grew up in such chaos that my life is so quote boring now, even though it's like really great. Like there's no fighting. It's, it's yeah. great. And I'm like, let me just throw a grenade in this <laughs> because there's no <laughs> chaos. Like what right. can I do? Who can I piss off in my house? Right. Um, and to recognize just that, that calm can yeah. be happy. And we don't have to go to these old patterns of chaos or 
like that we, we choose the level, but it is a choice. Yeah. And so many times it goes back to the worthiness, right? Is it, I'm not worthy to choose this level is, you know, it's such a great I question. think it's practice, you know, too. I think it's practice. And I think just even like what you're saying, the questions you're asking yourself, kind of seeing where it started, you know, when, when we prefer that door slamming, people not speaking to each other, the makeups, the breakups, the, the chaos, the relational chaos, it's almost like we're mistaking that for life force. Yes. You Energy. know what I mean? We're yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, oh, that feels, if that feels like life, mm, right. no, maybe not. Maybe, maybe, maybe life is just supposed to feel like this ever increasing smooth joy ride, like just smooth, smooth joy ride of resilience when, when times get hard, when you experience loss of hopeful expectation that you know things are working out and you know all is well and it's going to be okay so you're looking for you're looking for everything that works and that becomes your experience right yeah. it's like you stub your toe the day is over you know what i mean it's like then you stub your toe you drop your papers your car doesn't start the blip, 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 blip. But it's like, what's working right now? And start building on that. I mean, try it, test it. You know, uh, everybody should test that out. That is how I remind myself how powerful I am. You ask that question, what's working? Oh yeah, what's working? Mm -hmm. What's working? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, <laughs> what, what, am I, yeah. what am I loving right now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Love, 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 love. You know, it's kind of like, it's, it's churning the old dream pot. It's churning the good feeling pot where next thing you know, you've created this atmosphere around that day that is filled with possibility and, and fun and ease. Ease. Ah, let's throw a grenade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't like that word. Ah. Yeah. Like my little pregnant pause there when you said ease, I was like, ease is so <gasps> good. Well, listen, so, th so that's a word for me, you know, mm -hmm. because my life was not filled with ease. It was totally nut and folly, you know, up before the sun comes up, throwing two weddings a day, the producing the, oh my God, this is canceled. This isn't going to work. This tire fell off the bus. This is happening and trying to do it in a way that nobody notices. That felt very, very crazy and chaotic for me. So I crave ease. And also I've come to believe that things are supposed to be easy and it's only me that knots it up with complications. So I wanna to continue to ask that question about how can I bring more ease to my life because I like things easy. Yeah, and that's also a habit. I mean, it's, yeah. it's totally a habit to look at the good and not to, to, you know, to ask yourself the right question. How can this be easy? That's brilliant. For and sure. I'll go, it can't, here's my grenade. <laughs> what did you pick a word for this year? Um, you know, that's funny. I have done that every year and I feel like January just snuck up on me yeah. and I didn't pick a word, but I think that's a great one. <laughs> yeah, easy. easy. That would be a good one for you. Yeah, maybe yeah. it is. Maybe that would be a good one for you. Because all my other words have been um, powerful things, you know, like movement, inertia, and, you know, you're right. I should be like yeah. laxative. <laughs> that should be that is hilarious. Easy, that is hilarious. soft serve. Yeah. yeah, not to make poop jokes, but I, have, I do have two kids, you know, got to have poop jokes. Um, so this is kind of a geeking out question about just your experience with the Oprah show. What was your favorite show? I just want to know, was there one that you were like, this was it, this is my favorite experience or most proud of? Oh, you know what? It's, 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 it's like, they're all babies. Uh, you know, the ones I can remember, honestly, because it was, it's a blur. Um, but 
you know, the, the one third, that, that last season was pretty special. You know, we, you know, taking the audience to Australia and pulling all that off. And, um, you know, we just had so many, it was, it, it, there was a sense of ease about that season because everybody wanted to come on. Everybody said, yes, the world was our oyster. We knew that it was, a, you know, we had a year to say goodbye. Um, we did uh, the big, big shows at the United Center as, as part of our fa farewell, which was, I, I was really, really proud of those. And, you know, the last show, the last show is just like, boom, the lights go off and there it is. So knowing that, so I would say that last year, knowing that um, uh, the team, um, all of the team, everybody in that organization met the moment, you know, met the moment. It was worthy of the legacy of what that show meant. And uh, that, that feels really good. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your book, The Beautiful No and yeah. Other Tales of Trials, Transcendence and Transformation. Okay. Yeah. The Beautiful No. Let's start with that. What does well, that Well, The mean? Beautiful No. Well, early on, I was telling you about how I found my way to the Oprah show. The Beautiful No is the name of the title story in the book. And it is the story about how I had applied at the Oprah show when I was in, in advertising. I quickly got rejected because two different worlds, TV, advertising, very different. And so I decided, okay, then uh, maybe I'll be a freelance agency producer and I'll try to get, uh, a, I'll, I'll try to get in the door at a really, really big agency, a very top agency. And so I did, I, 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 I was a terrible freelancer because that means you have to dial for dollars and get jobs for yourself. I didn't care for that part. Right. I like to do the work. I didn't like selling myself. So quickly I'm out of money and in a terrible financial <laughs> straits. And now I, I better get my ass back into a staff job as quickly as possible before I'm in, you know, really serious trouble. So I, um, a friend got me an interview with the executive producer at a big, huge agency. And I was, I was feeling pretty desperate but I sparkled. I went in there and sparkled and he basically hired me in the room. You're exactly what we want. You're everything I'm looking for. I'm going to pay you a ton of money. I'm going to put you on our best accounts. I mean, I walked out of there going, oh my God, like I had, had won um, the lottery, celebrated champagne with friends, the whole thing. Well, as the story goes, the letter arrives a week later from HR. He never does call me, but I do get a form letter saying they're not hiring. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so devastated. And we've all been there when you wanted something really, really bad. You thought you had it and it, it, it you're rejected, soundly rejected. So I really, that was, and, and so now I'm 35 and now I'm out of money once more. I'm in a career weirdness and I was supposed to be a, 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 a talented, promising person, um, according to, to people who knew me. So it, it was, I just felt like such a failure again. And it was as low as I had felt in a long time. And I, I kind of just went underground for a little while, just kind of gave up, just opened my hands. Well, then universe, I don't know what's supposed to happen. And I get a message saying on my answering machine, that's what it was called back then. An answering machine had actual tape in it. I knew those two. <laughs> you know, like rewind, fast forward. And the, the message said, this is so-and-so at the Oprah Winfrey show. We were cleaning out a closet and found your resume. <laughs> Will you come in and freelance for us? And that was the beginning of everything, but it wasn't until a few years later where I, 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 I put it together. Oh, if I would have gotten that big fancy job with all that money and all those benefits after being so scared, I wasn't going to be able to support myself. I never would have quit it a short time later to go take a chance at the Oprah show. Never. I know it. I know myself. I would have said too late. Yeah. Now here's what's fascinating. Fast forward 
25 years. Uh, the agency's gone out of business like no one ever thought it would, you know, and then I go on to have this amazing career. So that is, so, so it was understanding that that no that I got, as devastating as it was, was the most beautiful no I'd ever been given. And now it's really become a foundational spiritual principle. I, I challenge everybody listening, go in your life, pull up your nose, the person who didn't love you back, the job you didn't get, the thing you were hoping was going to happen that didn't happen, the door that slammed in your face or never opened, and see how, if that would have happened, how different your life would be. Yes. How, how so many of the gifts, the experiences, the gifts, the love, the joy, the, the life experience wouldn't have been possible if things had gone another way. And that's why I call it the beautiful no. Because wouldn't it be great if right when we get that moment of devastation, we can take one day in our jammies <laughs> with dirty hair, eating too many chips, and then come right out of it knowing, okay, let's see where this is going to take me. Take back years for our lives, you know? Yes. Yes. And I, I feel this so much. I had a terrible business partnership go awry years and years ago. And I thought, you know, I didn't think like this is the end, but it was really disappointing. I mean, it was just a moment where I thought, man, what do I do now? And the answer was, you know, I'm going to sit in my jammies and eat chips all day for like a little bit. It was like a day, just like you said. And then I yeah. thought I better get to work because, and I look at that moment and how I was devastated for months and months, but I wouldn't have written, I wouldn't have gotten my first book republished second edition. My second book would not have been a part of it because it came as a package deal. This podcast came out of it. Everything I'm doing right now that I love happened because that broke apart, you know, beautiful and now. so it's beautiful. I'm so grateful for it. And so that is, and, and just like you said, you ask yourself every day, what's going right or what's working, what's working. You can usually trace it back to that. No, <laughs> today is working because that without was without a doubt. And I doubt, I mean, you can sit down with friends anytime and say, what about that guy you loved in college? You were madly in love and you really wanted to marry him. Oh, you know, and then you see what, what your life would have been. And you'd be like, oh my God. That <laughs> yeah, I have that guy too. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's, you know, beautiful no's are happening all the time. And you know, what, what the beautiful no asks of us, what this philosophy, this, this little knowing asks of us is to get to that place of knowing a little bit quicker than we used to because good things are coming and understand that that is that faith. That is that trust we talk about. It's knowing, oh, this is going to lead to something really good. Can't wait to see it. Right. Even oh, as we're it. wiping the, the chip crumbs off the couch, you know, <laughs> like picking them out of our bra. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So the awesome thing about your book, it came out in 2019, I believe, yep. but you mm -hmm. are now releasing February 16th is the paperback, which comes yes. with a workbook. Hey, it does. Everyone loves two the books in one. It's a awesome. whole new thing. Two, two books in one. It's really great. Yes. Really so that's the it. beautiful no. So everyone go out and buy it. I encourage every listener to buy the author's book. This is very important to us. <laughs> so oh my God. I'm so happy. happy. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, there, you know, it's the time of it's the time of sheltering in place. And so, you know, all the traditional means of going out and meeting readers are are really not, you know, available to us. So yes, please, please pre-order or or buy the book uh, wherever you want. Um, I have links at sherrysalata.com. Um, but I think it'd be a really good experience. You know, if Excellent. anything we're talking about is interesting to anybody. And if it's not, you're dead inside. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> you're just dead inside. So don't buy the book and don't bother. But no, yes, this is the stuff though. This, if you're feeling like you're struggling, like this conversation, everything we touched on, this is it. This is it. This is acceptance. This is the only and, thing yeah. I want to talk about. And, and, you know, when we have this conversation, I'm not coming from a place of having figured it all out. 
I know that I'll be figuring it all out till I have my, my last breath. It comes from every time I have this conversation in, in my life, in, in interviews like this, wherever I go, I'm reminded what I say I'm claiming for myself. I'm reminded, yes, 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 yes. Um, this is what I believe. This is what I'm choosing for myself. And I know it's possible. Yeah. And that's the same reason I do what I do. It's the same reason I sit yes. down and coach women in podcasts. It's a, it's a reminder. It keeps me on this path of being grateful and loving my life and showing up for it. Where if I was just writing, I don't know, magazine articles, I just hide in my house and eat chips. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the showing up. And so yeah, I'm is. so grateful you showed up today, Sherry. This was wonderful. And thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Hi, and welcome to the same 24 hours podcast. I'm Meredith Atwood, author of the book, The Year of No Nonsense. I'm a former attorney turned writer, speaker, and Ironman triathlete. Although right now, all I really like to do is lift weights. We all have the same 24 hours, but it's what we do in those hours that leads to our greatest health, happiness, and success. It's my goal to crack the code on a life of less nonsense so we can all make the most of our 24 hours.